we will be joining um, if the um, so i'll let them in as they come but if the beeping sound is a bother i'm sorry but i'll mute soon enough um so hello everyone um, thank you for joining us on this panel discussion titled attack on our hosts sagramala adani and people's resistance my name is akshay i'm from collectives bangalore unit um, we have with us today three brilliant speakers with a lot of experience and knowledge uh, environmentalist and clim climate activist samya datta uh, trivandrum based independent journalist and researcher sindhu nepolian and uh, fisher rights activist k saravanan from uh, vetiver collective chennai um we will have 20 minutes each for each speaker to talk and at the very end we will have a combined uh, q and a section um you can leave your questions in the chat box or hold on to them and ask them directly during the q and a as well um before we begin a little bit about collective itself um collective is a left revolutionary student youth organization primarily active in delhi and bangalore um it was started in 2015 and in bangalore we have been active for the past one and a half years um in emerging from uh, the pandemic then uh, this involved like discussions among students and young people on topics like fascism in liberal democracies the farmers movement the queer and women's movement and so on um we have also been part of uh, resisting the saffronizing forces within karnataka first against the school textbook uh, revisions where uh, several progressive figures were removed from them from the history textbooks at a national level we have been part of the mazdoor adhikar sandarsh abhiyan's efforts to resist the four labor codes and we have been part of the campaigns and rallies of the same both in bangalore and delhi and also raised awareness among students about the codes themselves um since it has been a politically significant year internationally um some of our discussions also revolved around uh, Um, movement, movements in uh, Sri, Sri Lanka, Iran, Chile, Brazil, and so on. Um, so our latest magazine issue was also framed through this international lens. Anyone who wants wishes to get a copy can get get in touch with us later. Um, all right. Now about today's matter of discussion and its importance. In the past few years, there has been quite a lot of activity happening across the coastal belt of our country in different states with coasts. you notice that there are just a vast number of coastal development and industrialization projects that are either proposed or are in progress in um uh, in karnataka alone a total of 81 projects that have to do with port development or modernization inland water transport or tourism or fisheries uh, have been proposed and 574 projects in total across the um, coastal belt of india several of these are just are facing massive opposition from um, coastal people who will be affected by them uh, most of these new port projects come under the sagarmala scheme introduced by the bjp central government what is the sagarmala scheme um, it is said to be uh, for improving the coastal logistical infrastructure of the coastal regions basically making it easier for industries to use the coast for trade and transport among other aspects it is part of a larger push from the government to promote something known as blue economy which is uh, just policy speak for creating capital through resources found in the ocean and the coast this push however is not some uh, coming from just from the central government but is part of the agenda set forth over a decade ago by international financial institutions like the world bank and the imf for developing nations to adopt blue economy so that the global market can enter further into this new territory um if you look at where this or originates we can trace it to a policy report from the world bank in 2009 titled sunken the sunken billions which is pointing to the billions being sunk or wasted by not exploiting the ocean and uh, coastal resources one of the basic natures of capitalism is that it always needs new markets to enter and exploit new resources to grab and venture into blue economy is uh, sees this the ocean and the shores as this new resource so sagarmala proje projects and by extension the idea of blue economy can be seen as part of this new neoliberal push from the global market 
and these projects are coming into conflict with the communities traditionally residing in these regions, mostly fish workers, because often these projects mean that they lose their land or lose access to um, the ocean and the, that way lose their means of livelihood. While these communities are left behind, the so-called port-led growth is benefiting uh, large corporations like the Adani, point that you will have to ask which Adani port. Um, one of the major protests against Adani port happening, uh, Adani port projects happened against the one coming up in Viringham in Kerala. And uh, um, similarly, the port com uh, project coming up in Katapalli uh, uh, near Chennai is also strongly opposed by the people's movements there. The coastal communities in these places or elsewhere are not only concerned for their livelihood, but also deep, the deeply sensitive coastal ecosystem that these projects are tampering with. Both these aspects are, of course, like tied together. Um, these types of construction work change the topography of the region itself, and that leads to a cascade of ecological after effects. At a time when we are seeing increasing extreme climate events with frequent floods and cyclones, we can realize how catastrophic such uh, development work can be if they are careless. Even in a landlocked city like Bangalore, where I stay, um, we saw what happens when you build things over like wetlands with this year's uh, massive floods that took over the city. So it is in this context of both threat, both in terms of the socioeconomic conditions of the people and the climate crisis that we are having this conversation today. Um, so we will begin with uh, Mr. Samidatta, who is with us today to discuss the larger implications um, of this these aspects, um, followed by uh, Sindhu Nepalian and then by uh, Kesh Sarvanan, um, who will focus on Kerala and Tamil Nadu respectively. Samidatta uh, is a long-standing people's science and climate justice activist who has uh, written extensively on climate, energy, governance, re uh, rivers, etc. He has engaged with multiple nature-dependent li livelihood-based communities and also intervened in sub-national, national, and international policies and frameworks over the uh, past 50, uh, last 15 years. He is uh, associated with multiple organizations like the South Asian People's Action on Climate Crisis, um, National Platform for Small Scale Fish Workers, Friends of the Earth India chapter, and many more. Um, so thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Um, I'll let you take the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, first question is, uh, my background too noisy? Um, there is some noise, but I think it is manageable. I don't think there is. Yeah. Okay, because uh, there's some construction work going on on the opposite side, if it is not too disturbing, then I'll stay here. I hope every, everyone's okay with that. It's not, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Fine. So, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this and thank you for uh, inviting me. So, I'll begin with uh, the climate, since you have been talking about the climate change, actually we have started uh, quite a number of years ago. We have been talking about it as a climate crisis, it is which are suffering this. But I will also speak on uh, the twin aspects, how the communities and the people in coastal areas and also those who depend on the coastal oceans and the seas, how they are getting hit by the double impacts. One is the physical impacts of the climate crisis. Second, lot of, because the developmental projects will be talked about, I will not for focus too much on that, but in the name of solution to the climate crisis, there are several global uh, pushes, not only initiative, global pushes in terms of new directions, new frames of uh, development, so how these are also doubly impacting these communities. So first of all, I think I don't need to uh, repeat, many of you know, over the last few years, and let me focus a little bit first on India. Uh, over the last few years, particularly the five years, the coastal regions of India has actually changed quite a lot. As you might know, the India's eastern coast is more prone to, was more prone to cyclones. And almost on average, every year, one big cyclone is to hit the eastern coast, starting from Tamil Nadu to uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh also. 
And in this connection, when we talk about India, uh, we cannot really isolate India or Bangladesh because in South Asia, the South Asian countries are actually tied together by three of the biggest natural uh, natural connections and one, of course, the human connection. These three natural connections are the three seas. So they are Bengal, Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, the Himalayas, and the Southwest Monsoon, the Asian South Asian Monsoon. So these affect all kinds of climate and other right, even apart from climate, most aspects of all lives. So what has happened over the last five, six years is that, you know, this, as I was saying, the eastern coast where was actually more cyclone prone over the last 110 years or so, if you go by record, something like 108 cyclones have hit the eastern coast. But the western coast was far less cyclone prone. And the reason being the Arabian Sea sea surface temperature was much lower comparatively. And the Arabian Sea is there is something called wind shear that was quite high. We have been noticing that over the last five years, both these conditions have changed. The Arabian Sea is heating up faster than the Bay of Bengal and the other parts of Indian Ocean, North Indian Ocean, because the area India and South Asia is affected by the sea as well, is called the North Indian Ocean zone. So the North Indian Ocean zone, Arabian Sea is heating up much faster and the wind shear pattern here has also changed. As a result, if you see the records, in the last four years, there are four big cyclones in the western coast of India also. And this is impacting the western coast's coastal population. The primary impacted group, but not the only one, are the coastal fish workers, but also the inland fish workers close to the coast and the farming community, which is close to the coast. But the other community that is also getting very badly hit is the small-scale tourism operator. There are tens of thousands of small scale tourism operators along the coast. These are not small hotels. So these are impacted, getting impacted tremendously. So, and the uh, kind of people that used to depend on simple tourism activities like boats, like uh, some uh, mangrove tourism, etc. Et so this is, on the one hand, pushing on the livelihoods of coastal communities. If you look at this, this year itself, there are four or five cyclone warnings. And the fish workers are saying every cyclone warning, the government comes out with an advisory. Don't, there is a cyclone threat. Don't go to the sea for the next five days. So if you add up five into five, 25 days, and the fish workers, particularly the coastal fish workers, the entire year is not the fishing season. Because you know the breeding season is off. There are monsoon seasons, some days where are normally it's very risky. So out of roughly around 180 days of their livelihood days, where they can earn their livelihood, if you take out 25, 30 days as very unsafe, so this is telling very strongly on their livelihoods and their earnings. People are losing lives at a much faster rate in the sea, at a much lower rate in the land. Because over the last... 20 years, one other thing which is a positive development which has happened is the cyclone tracking, forecasting, the warnings and evacuation. These four functions of the governments, particularly in the, uh, okay, I can't help it because uh, I am in a, uh, I'm going to what, logging into my mobile phone. So is it okay now, the sound? Is it okay, the sound? I think it is better now, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. So, oh, what is happening is, uh, over the uh, last several years, these repeated cyclones, the cyclone warnings, all this is hitting. Whereas, where the news, news media picks up is there is a drastically reduced toll on human lives. That's true. Because as I said, the four aspects of cyclone tracking forecasting of the tracks, warning and evacuation. This has drastically improved. But this has improved mostly in the eastern states. If you travel across the coastal areas of from Andhra Pradesh to West Bengal and even Bangladesh, you will see a huge network of well-constructed cyclone shelters. If you travel in the western coast, just because they were 
Whether or not cyclone so much cyclone bloom, the cyclone is another network in the western coast is Rago. So people are not only uh, losing lives, their cattle and animal wealth is going, and the infrastructure, that is houses, structures, business structures, small ones, these are all getting very, uh, very frequently, these are getting damaged. In fact, uh, I was working with the Sundarban communities and in the last, this October only when I came back, this is the third cyclone this year, which hit in those areas, Sagar Island, Pathar Pratima, those kind of uh, areas. And every time a cyclone hit, even if it is a small cyclone, it's not making a huge disaster, but the electricity line goes, the fields are flooded, the roads are flooded, the areas are cut off for five to six days, there is no power for five, six days. So the entire life in the coastal areas is getting disturbed. And not only that, because of this repeated incursion of saline water, because whenever there is a uh, coastal storm, whether it is categorized as a deep, uh, strong deep depression or as a cyclone of category one to five, five is obviously the extreme. Every time, along with the wind, there is a storm surge. The saline water also comes in. And the once the saline water reaches the bunding, the magnet, and it comes into your land, It contaminates next the water resources, that is the drinking water resources. It contaminates the uh, ponds where a large part of the fish water sea fishing is of two kinds. One is called capture fisheries, one is called culture fisheries. She see the coastal fish workers who go out to the ocean seas, they are capture fishes. And those in the coastal region of the same families may cultivating fish, they are called, they are in the culture fisheries. So culture fisheries in the coastal areas also has been devastated because of the saline water in culture. Only in 2021 when the cyclone Yash hit the eastern coast, something like 15,000 fishing ponds where the fish used to be cultured and you were a big livelihood support, but devastated because all of them, the fish left Fish dry up to some of these are known to you. Let me come down quickly to what are the large scale pictures in the climate governance in the international and national scene. Because of the crisis of the climate, because all of us know that we have very few years left and there is no question about that, that being increased. The IPCC reports, the WMO reports, all of it is, is showing that we have hardly 10 years, less than 10 years left for a drastic action on the global scale, uh, reducing our emission by 45% at least by 2030. So that's not happening. So what is increasing in the global scale, the governments, the corporates, and the financial institutions, which are global and regional, all of them got together, and they are now singing a new tune that since the mitigation, which is reduction of the greenhouse gases, which is causing this climate crisis, is not happening at a desired rate, not even near, anywhere near the desired rate. So let us focus on other kind of actions. What are these other kinds of actions? If you recall, just before the Sharm El Sheikh uh, COP27 started on 6th of November, on the, on the 6th of November itself in the night, the there is a, see all of you will probably also know about the Paris Agreement, which was signed in 2015. In Paris Agreement, like all other agreements, there are a lot of articles. In Paris Agreement, the Article 6, particularly the Article 6.2 and 6.4, deals with market mechanisms to tackle climate change, that is market mechanisms for mitigation. These market mechanisms are not actual reduction by the most by the biggest polluters, but they will give some, some money to some poor developing country entity. That entity can be a group of farmers, can be a group of uh, forest dwellers can be a company and they will do something which will notionally reduce their carbon emission and that polluting entity, be it a company, be it a, a university, be it a aviation company, whoever, they will take the credit. So this is called a carbon market mechanism by which without actually reducing, we can still reduce. So, so the advisory committee on R2 to ocean carbon dioxide removal, ocean CDR, 
as an approved mechanism for the Paris Agreement market mechanism. What does this mean is large scale engineering engineering intervention called geoengineering in the oceans are where approved. That is the recommendation was to approve this for the market mechanism. If this go, went through, fortunately, some small countries with the climate justice movement made a huge lot of noise. We talked to a lot of small country delegates in the climate negotiation. So they objected. If this went through, it would have been opened up for the corporate and corporates, big corporates who are big polluters and the financial institution. Clearing which fundamentally changes and be interventions in terms of ocean CDR, carbon dioxide removal, where plankton booms are encouraged, which leads to deoxygenation, de -oxygenation, which leads to lack of fish. Because any algal, toxic algal blooms, so all these experiments are going on. And this was just as the private negotiations opened. This was approved. Fortunately, as I said, this was stopped. This was sent back to the committee for reconsideration as a dangerous mission. But there are a lot of other things happening. There is over the last few years, taking advantage of the climate crisis because the climate crisis being seen, they are seeing that this is not just a challenge. This is also a big opportunity for new kind of markets, new kind of investment and new profits, sources of profits. So one of these, Akshay just mentioned that coastal activities in the coastal region and seas. See, unless you can remove carbon dioxide from the, what is being happening because mitigation is known as push for removing carbon dioxide. And since we know very clearly the forests were identified as the cheapest means of removing carbon dioxide. So on the one hand, there is an attack on forest level target is the blue carbon. And that's now part of the blue economy. What is blue carbon? In which, which grow fast and which grow in the shadow coastal waters, they are supposed to give more carbon sequestration if encouraged to understand how fish workers, particularly the small scale fish workers, coastal fish workers, they depend not on the deep, very much within the continental shelf. So these are the areas which are not now being targeted by this blue carbon economy. Part of the blue economy, land has a lot of other competing uses, urbanization, villages, roads, you have uh, uh, food production areas as farms. Seas are supposed to be not so much contested. Seas, particularly the salmon parts of the continental shelf, shallower parts of the continental shelf grow most. So that is one area which is being targeted. The other area is all coast, the entire uh, projects, they target the entire ocean by encouraging phytoplankton boom, by adding nutrients to the ocean. So these are on one hand, these are coming. So the blue carbon route is now a very popular discourse. If you recall that just three days ago, the event of diversity, then the conference of parties number 15 ended. And they have come out with a very quote unquote very popular positive resolution. What is this positive resolution? See, I am mean, saying the resolution itself is such a, such a, it says that as you all know, based on IP, the diversity of both the marine environment and the land environment is 
serious treatment. And that's one is the rising temperature of the sea seawater, which actually is pushing many life out. The second is rising acidity, because added as it dissolves more and more carbon dioxide, the pH level of the ocean waters actually in the last 200 years have gone down by 40 percent. That means it has become less than 1% of the entire ocean area, but they are actually shelters or not just roughly 20 to 25% of marine biodiversity. So the coral reefs, because of the rising temperature and dropping pH, that is increasing acidity, coral reefs are tremendously impacted by the direct impact because coral, if you see the data, 40% of global coral reefs have already died and the projections are by 2070, as we are going, the entire coral reef of the oceans, of the global oceans, will completely disappear, will die, will bleach out and die. So that will have even larger impact. We are already having an impact with this 40% wipe out of global coral reefs. This is going to increase. So even there, the protected areas are targeted to coral reefs, shallow coastal waters, in the continental shelves. And these are exactly the areas where small scale fish workers and medium scale fish workers, even those with very small trawlers and all, these are dependent on these kind of areas. So once you have seen that they are impacted on the impacts, direct physical impacts of the changing climate systems. On the other hand, they are also excluded and impacted by the solutions that are coming, whether it is green, uh, sorry, blue carbon, whether it is protected zones in the oceans. There are other imp other inventions coming. See, just before me, uh, when Laksh uh, Akshay was uh, introducing, you talked about coastal infrastructure. One of the uh, clear targets, see, this is what India is doing in the name of uh, the coastal development, Sagar Mala, Bharat Mala, all this. It's not Indian model. It's a copy of Chinese model. And this is a very old idea, 5,000 year old idea, that any civilization, it develops when trade happens in wide, large scale. And trade uh, traditionally used to happen through uh, the Sudha Seas 5,000 and 5,000 years ago. But even now, roughly 80% of global bulk trade happens through the ships, seas and oceans. So every country, and this has been a continuous theme song, whoever controls the global trade routes has the biggest influence. It's historically also true. So China's Belt and Road is not only on road, the trade routes on road, the trade routes on the seas. So India is trying to be a poor copy of Chinese model of trying to control the trade and improve the economy through trades. And this is again GDP, GDP focused growth, not people focused improvement, people focused development. So the attacks on coastal areas are coming on the one hand through this model of port-led growth or trade-led growth. How much opportunity is left for that? That's a debatable thing. A lot of scholars have pointed out that we don't have enough resources to create another China, to remodel uh, India into China. So that's beyond the realms of possibility. But even with that, there is some little possibility of earning money at the expense of the natural ecosystem and the expense of small users in the coast. So one of the, again, because the coastal areas have become more vulnerable, in the name of vulnerability and in the name of resilience building, 
what the indian government is repeatedly doing is trying to evacuate the small scale dwellers the farming communities villages and mostly the fishing communities often who live on uh, temporary shelters like if you go to many gujarat areas in the gulf of kutch they don't have their villages in the coast they live in the coast for 7 to 8 months in uh, shacks and they go back to their villages for the rest of the year so they are trying to occupy those areas also in the name of vulnerability that these areas have become more vulnerable so you will be shifted out if you look at it the vulnerability increases in terms of what is your investment and what is the risk of loss if this i'll end by saying i think i have i am coming close to 20 minutes akshay okay. yeah yeah around 2 3 okay. so i around 2 3 minutes fine so i'll end by saying this if you look at which are the losses that are larger a coastal community of fish workers or a small village of poor people can quickly evacuate that has been shown time and again hundreds and hundreds of time evacuations have taken place in the last several decades in fact even in the eastern coast now every year three to four evacuations take place every year and they can come back quickly the only thing is needed that their infrastructure they are both their private property of small houses and the public a public infrastructure of cool cell center this need to be reinforced and strengthened which is very much possible whereas for a for a large infrastructure a billions of billion dollar investment or 1000 crores of investment the amount of losses that they can face are far higher in spite of sea walls in spite of concrete structure there is no clear example in the world that you can stop first thing the sea level rise and the con consequent erosion which is actually eating away the underground structures so that even the sea walls and big structures falling apart if you have seen what is happening in jakarta the city of jakarta was trying to build sea walls 50 km sea walls spending billion dollars what was happening is as the sea level rises and the but these groups this corporate groups and the financial institutions they are focused on a short time span of 20 to 25 years they are basically trying to maximize their profit and as a result the coasts are set coasts are seen as much less contested area because if you see a new industry going into any inland area trying to take the land of farmers there is a huge struggle the coastal areas are looked as as soft targets because the unfortunately targets, most of the unfortunately most of the coast in the immediate coastal region in the immediate coastal region they don't have the land title they use they are the users but they don't have the land title for much of the coast so this is being seen as a soft target conflict ridden areas are there con land conflicts are also at the water and the natural commons because if you have to establish a power plant or a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant in any inland area it is not only the land area it is also the huge amount of water the consumptive use and the cooling use the oceans are again seen as quote and quote infinite resources of water with the cooling water and the resources that are being quote and quote resources that are being used if you go to any coastal area where there is a thermal power plant or a nuclear power plant this actually leaves out a huge amount of warm water by 7 to 8 degrees and this also devastated the resources there and this is i have done a study in mundra in coastal gujarat and we have see documented this species by species of fish how this has been devastated after first the adani mundra power plant and then the tata mundra power plant came up so coastal communities are under multiple attack one by the direct impacts of the physical changes in the climate systems as i detailed not only the cyclones but the sea level rise the coastal erosion and the salinity ingress which is taking away their livelihood base but they are also under attack by the so called solutions both from the global financial institutions and the corporates 
in the name of blue carbon, the blue economy, and resilient infrastructure, as well as from the Indian government and Indian corporates, by their own plans of the course being less contested, course being a softer target than inland. So I'll end here. Afterwards, if there are questions, I'll go into details. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Samia. Uh, sir, uh, that was very comprehensive, especially um, the aspects on uh, uh, blue carbon is something that even I have not uh, didn't really know much about. So that was very insightful. Um, if people have more questions to Samia, please post them on the chat. Uh, we can get to them during the uh, Q and A segment. But for now, uh, I think we can set this sets a good context to focus more on the specific movements that are happening on the coast. Um, so we have. Uh, uh, Napoleon with us to speak on the movement against the uh, Adani port coming up in Birmingham. Um, Sindhu Napoleon is uh, an independent uh, journalist and a researcher, um, researcher in media and communication. Um, she belongs to the Mukuvar community, uh, a traditional marine fishing community in South India, and her father is an artisanal fisherman. Um, she writes about issues on gender, development, culture, and media. Uh, currently, she's working as a station head of a community radio station, which contributes largely to the occupational safety of marine fishermen. And she's involved in a research pro project titled Forecasting with Fishers. She's also the founding member of um, Coastal Students Cultural Forum, an NGO working for the betterment of coastal youth. Uh, thank you, Sindhu, for being on this panel. Um, over to you now. Thank you, uh, talk. Am I audible now? People can hear. Yeah, yeah, you're very clear. Okay, okay, thank you. And um, it's very, um, uh, very happy, or uh, and uh, same time, um, very proud to hear what Saumya that I was uh, saying earlier because um, he has actually given a proper general understanding about how coasts all around india and the community the coastal communities in across india are on threat in this space and, and um, until last week um, because the, the, the people's protest is now got uh, ended uh, without really um, uh, reaching the demands or without really getting the uh, getting ensure without really fulfilling the, uh, the demands of the people or raised by the people um, in the case of being uh, or or the in, or in in the case of the protest against the fisher community against uh, this international seaport in Vilnium uh, run by Adani group um, it is it has several um, several aspects uh, I mean you can definitely when you google about the project you can definitely get how this particular project the, the, I mean, the history of the project and how it is not really a financially um, viable project and how much impacts it's going to make in the community, in the marine ecosystem and everything you can uh, get from the web, really. Um, I would like to add something here uh, is that um, this recent protest has given us a lot of lessons. Um, to be very honest, because um, in every part of the world, or in uh, at least in the case of India, um, when you are protesting against a very big corporate, uh, the the government's reaction or the state's reaction for it would always uh, look similar, whether it's a BJP government or it's a CPM government or it's, I mean, it's if it's a left government, whatever, they will all speak in the same language. That's what the main takeaway for me from this protest, because um, more than the, or, or uh, yeah, more than the um, 
impacts related uh, discussions or the environmental and um, ecological impacts of the bringing port to the traditional fisher community in Trivandrum. Um, all the discussions around this protest was mostly concentrated on uh, how a particular community is really standing against the uh, state's overall development uh, future. I mean, the entire Kerala larger society, uh, there are exceptional cases, but still, I am really wondering by uh, seeing uh, the, the, cost, the, the usual uh, environmental activist groups and uh, these, um, the, the spokespersons who always stand for the rights of the people, they are all be, uh, remained silent uh, during, throughout the building a protest time. Because in some some way or some other, they all uh, convinced that uh, this project is gonna gonna be or or in random district, which could possibly turn the city into a port city like Singapore or Dubai or something like that. And they all are really convinced that the fishers who are protesting against it are not really. Um, not really raising valid demands. I mean, uh, look at the look at the victims of uh, the community who are I mean who are who lost their lands and who lost their houses due to the extensive uh, coastal erosion, which was which was a byproduct of uh, or which is a by byproduct of this uh, Willingham uh, port project. Uh, when you visit. Uh, certain villages in Trivandrum, uh, certain coastal villages in Trivandrum, like Pundra, Valetura, Kochitopo, or, uh, or, or Shankamukham in that case. Shankamukham is pretty famous as it is one of the, as it was one of the prominent uh, beach uh, in this city to have almost gone. Uh, because of the terrible coastal erosion happening in that stretch. And the, the previous fishing villages I named were all neighboring villages of Shangamukham. So in all these places, uh, the people living in these places were experiencing severe coastal erosion for the past couple of years, like within the last 10 years maybe. They, uh, around... More um, around 200 houses are minimum. The families who were living in these houses are now displaced to uh, cement go downs and schools and fishery schools and everywhere. And you should you should uh, look at the living physical living uh, conditions of these cement go downs. Uh, I hope some of you. Some of you who are listening to this uh, session, or maybe at least some people from Kerala, if you are, I mean, if there are people in Kerala listening to this session, they might be aware about the whole uh, media uh, narratives on the very pathetic, and more than 250 families are now literally living in these go downs. All of them are having only four toilets to use, and um, there is con uh, the concept of privacy is just a concept there. You can't, you could not really get a, any any private life in that uh, go, go downs because of uh, people living in such a small hall in families. So uh, these are some recent um, direct. Uh, what victims of coastal erosion and there are set several studies which already proven that uh, this excessive or uh, extensive uh, coastal erosion result uh, happening in Trivandrum is all due to the breakwaters built as part of uh, building a port project. Uh, we were all, uh, we all had previous experience of of uh, uh, constructing breakwaters in Willingham for another thing. For that fishing harbour, 
the they have built the government has built around a 400 meter long breakwaters and as a as a result of that breakwater we had lost uh, so many houses in pundura and varithura this happened couple of years ago now imagine uh, for the willingham port project adani is planning to uh, build 3100 long kilo um, meter uh, breakwaters long uh, breakwaters so imagine the impact of uh, this construction could uh, could uh, have make for the living conditions of the fishing community in trivandrum and that's already happening and we are all witnessing it um i have i should like to um, give a particular example of this person called mary she she called me i mean i as a am a journalist who usually write about um, the community which i also belong to um, she, i got a call from mary chechi on 2019 uh, no 2020 uh, on in between the pandemic around the onam uh, time onam is the is a festival in kerala so i got a panic call from uh, one random uh, woman from this place called kochidop and she said i heard you are a journalist and please come and see what is happening here this is uh, we, uh, we just lost our house in front of us i mean it it just the sea just washed away my house when i was literally standing all now shifted to a nearby school and the government is saying the collector is saying that they will provide some uh, facility for us within 10 days from that day one i started talking to her and i start i always getting updates about her life or her family status she she lived in that school for 3 months and after when when the pandemic got over or the pandemic got um, um the intensity of the pandemic got lessened uh, they opened reopened the school and who lost their houses only during that month uh, during the uh, monsoon time of 2020 from kochado pally so she and her family had to move to uh, another place in valiyathura this up school in valiyathura and after some months from there also they had to move in valiyathura cement godown is the third place she and her family has reached that that was in last year so she was living there for more than a year now so her total uh, like more than 3 years now and finally she was always trying to talk in talk in media and talk with the government authorities even the church uh, church like uh, like uh, local uh, local administrations like or local um, leaderships like church and all but uh, unfortunately nothing has happened no steps or no initiatives have taken to 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 ensure a proper living uh, option to these families now i went to meet her last week last week and she was this is after like after several months i was in really uh, talking with her for last few months and now she is already or sh- now she is uh, trying to accumulate some money to um, somehow build a small house some kilometers away from the sea and she is she just want to leave the godown as soon as possible she i was i was first really happy knowing that finally she is building a house and she, i mean i asked her how are you managed to do this and why uh, did the government or the system help you in any way she said they are telling me that they could they they could uh, give 10 lakhs to my family but i am not sure but for the some time being i am um, my kids are growing up fast and i can't really continue in this uh, pathetic place for so long so now she is somehow trying to build a small house nearby but uh, except uh, one or two cases like hers none of the other families living in that godown are and and this is a thing we are talking about uh, kerala which is supposed to be um, high in its uh, all development 
indicators. I mean, in, in the case of education or in the case of health facilities and in all such form of, I mean, we already have this thing called Kerala, the, the, the so-called Kerala model, right? And here is what we see. There are 250 families from fishing communities living hardly five kilometers away from the uh, the administration of Kerala. I mean, the secretariat from the secretary, Kerala secretariat is hardly five kilometers away where these people are living, where this godown is located. And we are now talking about human rights and uh, how Kerala is uh, um, what a, a flag bearer of uh, human rights across India. So uh, this is the condition in the fishers. Uh, for, this is the real condition of fishers in my place or in this uh, Trivandrum district. And uh, this also raised certain uh, relevant questions like uh, who are the, just like what Saumedata just said, Saumedata just said, who are the real um, owners or who, who who are they going to give the ownership or the, or the real owners of these shorelines? Who are the real owners? His uh, families or even my parents does not really own uh, um, a title for uh, the, the 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 place we are living for years now. Uh, this is this was my my mother's uh, family um, house and my grandmother or any people before that never had titles for for the land or for the house we uh, live for for uh, centuries now. And this is the same in the case of all the fishing families in uh, Trivandrum, across Kerala. And, and we are, uh, we need to um, figure out how, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, we have this um, concepts like uh, coastal commons. See, uh, means that, that the uh, that the resources like coastline and everything is common in nature and uh, I mean imagine imagine uh, how these communities these fishing communities are now under threat and they had to displace or they had to uh, shift from their houses to a different place on either due to the coastal erosion kind of uh, reasons or because of the development projects uh, now getting implemented it across the state like uh, people like corporate for years now and the the recent protest against uh, bringing a port also not i mean also really not giving us any hope because the government was from the very beginning the government and the cabinet ministers was were trying to uh, tag this protest as uh, a, a conspiracy or uh, a protest led by some external forces and um, yeah, things like that. So um, we are trying to have a conversation between a state who is actually like they are judgmental in, in, in all, all essence and they are trying to tag us like you are not really protesting for the rights you are actually you have some vested interest and all so this is what happening for the uh, for the months now and we were when whenever we start talking about how how many kilometers have how many kilometers of shoreline have already lost and how many people have displaced already when we started about started talking about such such data they will immediately turn the discussion into no no you are not really uh, allowed to protest here and you uh, you some people are backing you uh, some extreme group can back. i mean this is the pattern and this is the thing i said at the uh, at the beginning of uh, this session this is the same thing uh, the state used to uh, uh, used to tell all the time and unfortunately here in the left part is also following the same pattern and that simply means that us people, uh, I mean, for people like uh, people like fishing communities and tribal communities and Dalits and uh, every such Bahujan or such uh, marginalized groups have to keep fighting and keep protesting throughout their life because of uh, because we are um, we are like 
by default we we are not really having so many privileges uh, that the mainstream communities and the, the upper class upper caste communities in india are already having so that's the uh, that's the unfortunate reality of the fishing community and yeah i am i'm just would like to end my words with that um, point thank you Um, thank you so much, Sindhu. Uh, thank you so much for the and the realities of the people there. Uh, and uh, there are usually a lot of polarizing opinions of who that go around people's movements like this. So it's this brings a lot of cl uh, clarity. And also the fact that uh, you brought out how um, there are in we we can think about how um, in in a neoliberal democracy and in under within neoliberalism um, we find that. Uh, like elected governments and NGOs have like a limit to what they can do within the rules of that game, uh, no matter which political spectrum they come from. So, um, coming from a left revolutionary standpoint, the struggle would be to um, push beyond that, push um, push not just for like electoral politics, but also for mass movements to be part of our agenda, part of the spectrum in which people can express themselves and. Uh, come to uh, the fore. So with that, we can move on to uh, talk about again. Now we have uh, Mr. Uh, Saravanan who will speak with us on the coastal issues related to the similar kinds of displacements of uh, commons, ecological effects and other aspects that are happening in Tamil Nadu, uh, specifically in and around Chennai, uh, where to there is a new Adani port uh, project in development. Um, K. Sharvanan is a fisher rights and coastal protection activist based in Chennai and is himself from the fisher community there. He is associated with organizations like Vetiver Collective and the Coastal Resource uh, Center. He has been an active RTI activist in fighting development projects that aim to take over marine commons that belong to the fisher community in Chennai. He is currently involved in coastal mapping um, work of creating maps that document how the fishing community uses the land, con combining participatory mapping techniques, government records, and historical data to take back the narrative of marine commons against the government's labeling of these places as wastelands that can be sold off to corporates or to be built over. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Sharman, for joining. The, uh, laptop's Tamil. mic is not working. Okay. Sir, uh, will you be speaking in Tamil or uh, English? If you, um... Tamil, Tamil. Okay. Sir, Tamil is better. All right. Um, hey, if you uh, in Tamil, um, would you be, could you pause after 10 minutes so that Comrade Mustafa can translate for you and then again continue after, after that? Is that okay? Uh, okay, oh, actually, thank, thank, thank you so much. much. So, uh, hey, I, uh, I shared the one, uh, okay. uh, one map. Actually, uh, uh, <coughs> so many other things are so much more than that. One, which is blue economy party. This is the blue economy map. The southern region is the southern region. eastern region blue color line is the total nautical mile. green color is the total nautical mile. Two green color boundary is 200 nautical mile. 
பிரத்யேக பொருளாதார மண்டலம் இஇ விஷன் அப்படின்னு சொன்னா இந்த சாகர் மாலா பாரத் மாலா சுதேஷ் தர்ஷன் இது போல விஷயங்கள் வரும் பட் சாகர் மாலா அப்படின்னு பாத்தீங்கன்னா போர்ட் பேஸ்ட் டெவலப்மெண்ட் அதாவது துறைமுகத்தை வச்சு துறைமுகத்தை மையமா வச்சு வளர்ச்சிகளை பத்தி இது பண்ணுவாங்க எல்லாம் வளர்ச்சி பண்ணிக்கணும் அதாவது சாலைகள் மூலியமா வாட்டர்வே மூலியமா பைப் லைன் மூலியமா ரயில்வே மூலியமா இணைச்சி போர்ட் பேஸ் போர்ட் ஒட்டு மொத்தமா ஒருங்கிணைச்சி அந்த போர்ட் பேஸ் டெவலப்மெண்ட் உருவாக்குறதுக்கான ஸ்கீம் தான் வந்து சாகர் மாலா பண்ணாங்க <laughs> சாகர் மாலா இந்த ப்ளூ எக்கனாமியா இருக்கட்டும் பாரத் மாலாவா இருக்கட்டும் இத ஒட்டு மொத்த விஷயமும் இது நிறைய மீனவர்கள் என்ன நினைக்கிறாங்கன்னா இந்த திட்டம் செயலாக்கு வரல அப்படின்னா அது உண்மை கிடையாது அதாவது ஒட்டு மொத்த வீரியமும் பாத்தீங்கன்னா இந்த எண்ணூர் பகுதியில் தான் செயலாக்கப்பட்டிருக்கு இப்ப நீங்க பாக்குற இந்த கிரீன் கலர்ல இருக்க ரோடு வந்து அவுட்டர் ரிங் ரோடு இந்த கிரீன் கலர்ல இருக்க கோடு வந்து அவுட்டர் ரிங் ரோடு இப்ப ரெட் கலர்ல ஒரு கோடு போட்டிருக்காங்க சென்னை பெரிஃபில் ரோடு இது வந்து சாகர் மாலா ப்ராஜெக்ட் சென்னை பெரிஃபில் ரோடு சாகர் மாலா ப்ராஜெக்ட் அதாவது மகாபலிபுரத்தில் ஆரம்பிச்சு உறகடம் ஸ்ரீபெரம்புத்தூர் எல்லா இண்டஸ்ட்ரியும் எல்லா இண்டஸ்ட்ரியும் டச் பண்ணி கடைசியாக அதானி போர்ட்டுக்கு போற மாதிரி வடி எயிட் லைன் ஹைவே வந்து சாகர் மாலா இல்ல பாரத் மாலா ரெட் கலர் ரோடு வந்து சாகர் மாலா பிங்க் கலர் இருக்கு பாத்தீங்களா இந்த ரோடு வந்து பாரத் மாலா அதாவது சாகர் மாலாவை வந்து வலுப்படுத்துறதுக்கு பாரத் மாலா சென்னை பெங்களூரு ஹைவேவும் எல்லாமே வந்து பாத்தீங்கன்னா போர்ட்ட மையமா வச்சு அதானி போர்ட்ட மையமா வச்சு வளர்ச்சி பணிகளுக்கான ரோடு கனெக்டிவிட்டிய பண்ணிருப்பாங்க representative from the government and the saga mall is a port based for the development by the adani group to like and i just see and they are making a scheme to like remove all these sports to make space for the chilling part and uh, and that the red line represents for the sagar mala and for the pink road it represents the bharat mala in which the sagar the mala is like okay can you continue please idu ipo lnt ship building idu இத இதுதான் வந்து எல்லோட இந்த சதர்ன் சைடு பிரேக் வாட்டர்ல இருந்து இந்த பார்ட் வரைக்கும் ஷிப் பில்டிங் இந்த பார்ட்ல இருந்து நார்தன் பிரேக் வாட்டர் வரைக்கும் எம்ஐடிபிஎல் அதாவது அதானி இப்ப இந்த குட்டி பார்ட் 
அதாவது கடல் பகுதியே நிலமிட்டு டெவலப்மெண்ட் பண்ண பண்ண போறாரு அதுக்கப்புறம் ரிவர் குள்ள இருக்கக்கூடிய இந்த ரெட் கலர் பவுண்டரி ஃபுல்லாவே அதானியோட ப்ராஜெக்ட்ல வரக்கூடிய பவுண்டரி கிரீன் கலர் வந்து டிக்கோ ஏற்கனவே வந்து இண்டஸ்ட்ரியலுக்காக ஒதுக்கப்பட்ட பகுதி இப்ப ரெண்டாயிரத்தி இருபதுல பொன்னேரி இண்டஸ்ட்ரியல் ஷிப்பா வந்து இந்த அதானி ப்ளூ கலர் பவுண்டரி வந்து இந்த ப்ளூ கலர் பவுண்டரி வந்து பொன்னேரி இண்டஸ்ட்ரியல் டவுன்ஷிப் ஏரியாவா அறிவிச்சிருக்காங்க இந்த இண்டஸ்ட்ரியல் டவுன்ஷிப் ஏரியாவோட நோடல் ஜோனா இந்த ஆரஞ்சு கலர்ல இருக்கக்கூடிய விஷயத்தை இது பண்ணிருக்காங்க ஒட்டு மொத்தமா காமராஜ் போர்ட்டோட சிஇயூ அவங்களோட மார்ஷல் பிளான் தனியா இருக்கு அதுக்கப்புறம் பாத்தீங்கன்னா ரயில்வே கேஸ் பைப் லைன் பெட்ரோல் பெட்ரோலியம் அதுக்கப்புறம் கேஸ் பவர் பிளான்ட் இது எல்லாமே ஒட்டு மொத்தமா பாத்தீங்கன்னா போர்ட் பேஸ்ட் டெவலப்மெண்ட் ஆல்ரெடி இந்த இந்த ரீஜன் ஃபுல்லா இந்த ஒட்டு மொத்தமா இந்த ரீஜன் ஃபுல்லாவே வந்து பாத்தீங்கன்னா இந்த சாகர் மாலா பாரத் மாலா எல்லாமே வந்து அதானி போர்ட்டுக்கான ஒரு டெவலப்மெண்ட்டை உருவாக்குறதுக்கான விஷயம் அதாவது உச்ச கட்டமா பாத்தீங்கன்னா இந்த எண்ணூறு பகுதியில இது எல்லா சாகர் மாலாட்டும் பாரத் மாலாவா இருக்கட்டும் உச்ச கட்டமா எல்லா வேலையுமே வந்து இங்க வந்து பண்ணிருக்காங்க green part the way the lines have been marked green right that i represent the poneri uh, industrial township area so that was a part allotted for them to for sorry sorry industrial uh, green color is a uh, tipo boundary the other group blue color blue, blue color is a uh, industrial poneri so industrial township area industrial township area but what they have done is that they have like, taken over the space along with that's the red lines where the adani group have like started their project basically they gone like over bounds and taking out these new places yeah that's it இந்த எல்என்டி இந்த மீனவ கிராமத்தை ரெண்டாயிரத்தி பத்து டைம்ல வந்து எடுத்து ஆர் அண்ட் ஆர் ஸ்கீம்ல மறு வேலை வாய்ப்பு மறு குடியேற்றம் என்ற பேர்ல வந்து மறு வாழ்வு மறு குடியேற்றம் என்ற பேர்ல அவங்கள கலாஞ்சி கிராமத்துல இடம்பெயர வச்சு வேலை கொடுத்தாங்க அவங்களுக்கு நிரந்தரமான வேலை எதுவும் கிடைக்கல அவங்க ஒரு அடிமைத்தனமான வாழ்க்கையை தான் வாழ்ந்துட்டு இருக்காங்க இன்னைக்கு அவங்களோட தொழில் செய்யக்கூடிய இடங்கள் வாழ்வாதார இடங்கள் எல்லாமே அவங்களோட கைவிடு போயிடுச்சு ஏற்பட்டதுனால அவங்களோட நிலப்பகுதிக்குள்ளேயும் கடல் வந்து உள்ள வந்திருக்கு இந்த அதானி துறைமுகத்தை பாத்தீங்கன்னா ரெண்டாயிரத்தி பத்தொன்பதுல இந்த ப்ரொபோசல் வந்து பண்ணாங்க பட் அதானி துறைமுகம் வரக்கூடிய இடங்கள் பத்தி ஒட்டுமொத்த ரெண்டாயிரம் ஏக்கர் வந்து கடல வந்து நிலமைப்பு செய்யக்கூடிய பகுதி ஒட்டுமொத்தமும் வந்து வாழ்வாதார ரீதியா மீனவர்களுக்கு ரொம்ப முக்கியமான இடம் மட்டும் இல்லாம இந்த பவுண்டரிக்கு இந்த ரெட் கலர் பவுண்டரிக்கு அதானியோட நியூ ப்ராஜெக்ட் முடிகிற பவுண்டரிக்கு இடையில பாத்தீங்கன்னா ஒரு சின்ன கடற்கரை தான் இருக்கும் இந்த இடத்துல அவங்க இது பண்ணாங்கன்னா கடல் அழிப்பு அந்த கல்வி பகுதி அதாவது இன்ட்ரல் வாட்டரும் கடலும் ஒன்னா போகக்கூடிய அபாயம் அவங்களோட இலக்கப்படுத்தப்பட்டது அந்த போராட்டத்தின் விளைவாக அந்த துறைமுகம் வந்து இப்போதைக்கு அந்த ப்ரப்போசல் வந்து பப்ளிக் ஏஐ முடிச்சாங்க மக்கள் கருத்து கொடுத்ததுக்காக அது கொண்டு போனாங்க ஆனா இப்ப வந்து மக்களோட போராட்டத்தின் விளைவாக மக்கள் கருத்து கூட்டமும் நடத்தல இஏஐ மட்டும் முடிச்சிருக்காங்க பட் டிஎம்கே அந்த டைம்ல வந்து எதிர்கட்சியா இருந்தாங்க அவங்க வந்து இந்த தாங்க அதன் பேர்ல வந்து இப்ப வரைக்கும் அத சட்டசபையிலும் பேசி இப்ப வரைக்கும் அந்த பப்ளிக் எதுவும் நடக்கல இப்போதைக்கு அந்த 
ப்ராஜெக்ட் வந்து இப்போதைக்கு ஸ்டாப்ல இருக்கு people were promised of employment from the fishing and the uh, uh, farming and stuff but they were unable to do so because of the other test going on and uh, the tamil nadu government uh, party rdmk promised them saying uh, if you win the election we are going to help you uh, win the protest let cancel the project uh, of that particular land which he had pointed out earlier and so uh, yet nothing has happened right. um, just to add yeah. uh, that, um, that the, the 2008 acres in which this is happening 2000 acres is uh, uh, sea area and 2000 acres is a backwater area total is a 4000 acre I enter is a inland fisheries also is a marine fisheries uh, also is a totally is affected to livelihood right yeah this project yeah that that is an important part that we wanted to bring up yeah but uh, sea and uh, in right of port is uh, already trigger to erosion also uh, right now is a uh, patal and also is a uh, sea inside the land area this port is a operation doing so total pulikat area is a merging sub uh, submerging is a happen to very quickly is a two year one year is a project is a running one year and two year after is a total this area is a submerging is a sea is a uh, drinking water storage is a uh, gone agriculture is a uh, gone this is a sector is gone neela porradathoda keela varad sagar inda sagar malava nariya edathula tamil nadu region tamil nadu muluvadum meenavargal vandu innum varala apdi dhaan paathu irukanga adu unma kadaiyadu ennur pagudhila kurippa tamil nadu la vadachennai pagudhila inda sagar malava sagar malava உச்சகட்டத்தை <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure sure yeah, yeah. so he said that uh, under fisher this livelihood sagarmal is a sub policy of and people are thinking that it has not come yet but it is evident in enor places especially in the north chennai uh, wherever the new uh, policies or interventions which are happening is almost related to the proposed project like changing of the acts gazettes and other new policies which are coming over mm-hmm. yes continue man uh, hello uh, yeah durga here i like to translate for someone the entire drinking water source is uh, erosion um, a uh, sea water intrusion uh, it will be collapsed so it, it it collapses the ecosystem livelihood uh, the uh, shoreline everything in here so uh, this uh, fishers usually think that the uh, the bark the bark mala or the sagar mala projects are not implemented but then these ports are coming to uh, sketches like these mean holistically as the uh, projects of the so all the infrastructure has, that is coming up proposed via via uh, government uh, orders and other orders these everything uh, uh, communicate i mean everything culminated to as the uh, bar- 
மையப்படுத்தி கடற்கரை ஓரமா வளர்ச்சி பணிகளை கொண்டு வர்றது இப்ப நிறைய பீச்சஸ் வந்து ப்ளூ பிளாக் சர்டிபிகேஷன் பண்ணி அது கீழே வந்து டூரிசம் டெவலப் பண்றதுக்காக மீன் பண்ணிட்டு இருக்காங்க தமிழ்நாட்டில் கோவலத்தில் அது பண்ணியிருக்காங்க இப்போ மெரினா பீச்சையும் ஐடென்டிஃபை பண்ணி அதையும் இது பண்ண பார்க்குறாங்க இப்போ அந்த ஐடென்டிஃபை பண்ண பீச்சில் மீனவர்களால் உள்ளே போக முடியாது வாழ்வாத ரீதியாக அவங்க மீன் காய வச்சது வள காய வச்ச விஷயங்கள்லாம் இப்போதைக்கு அந்த ஜோனுக்குள்ள பண்ண முடியாது அதே போல சட்டங்கள் இப்போ உதவியாக <laughs> 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 கேஷ் பைப் லைனாக இருக்கட்டும் ரயில்வே ப்ராஜெக்டாக இருக்கட்டும் ரோட் ப்ராஜெக்டாக இருக்கட்டும் போர்ட் பேஸ் இண்டஸ்ட்ரியல் டவுன்ஷிப்பாக இருக்கட்டும் ஸ்மார்ட் சிட்டியாக இருக்கட்டும் இது எல்லாமே வந்து இம்ப்ளிமெண்டேஷன் வந்து அரசு பண்ணிட்டு இருக்காங்க காரணம் அங்கே அதானி போர்ட்டுக்காக இது எல்லாமே பண்ணிட்டு இருக்காங்க ஸோ ஓகே கண்டினியூ ப்ளீஸ் கண்டினியூ so uh, tourism project ha- has also been uh, implemented in the form of swadesh darshan uh, schemes so in uh, tamil nadu the blue group in process and been recognized in uh, kovalam uh, this has been implemented in, because of this the fisher livelihoods they are uh, uh, um, uh, fishing uh, livelihood uh, practices like uh, fish drying uh, net mending area boat parking area these are all getting affected so in in uh, in uh, in future the marina is also uh, marina beaches is also in the process of getting the blue flag certificate boundary yeah. the policies are again uh, uh, implemented in various forms to attain the blue economy uh, goal so all over uh, in uh, all over tamil nadu these are uh, uh, implemented in various forms but in the in uh, in uh, in our region all the uh, uh, infrastructure projects like uh, uh, gas pipes Uh, waterways. Uh, waterways everything come in a speedy and uh, in a giant manner uh, to attain uh, the blue economy and to ease the uh, business of adani neela poruladartha porutha varaikku ivunga msp solt marine special plan solt one ready panni irukanga adha pilot eduva vandu pandicheri வந்து என்சிசிஆர் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் வந்து பண்ணியிருக்காங்க இப்போ கடலில் என்ன வகையான வளங்கள் இருக்குது எப்படி தான் ஒரு ஓவரால மலைன் அதாவது கடல் கடற்கரை சார்ந்த ஒட்டு மொத்தத்துக்கும் ஒரு பிளானை வந்து பண்ணுறது தான் எம்எஸ்பி பிளானாக பண்ணிட்டு இருக்காங்க இது ஒரிசாவோட பிளான் இது போல தான் வந்து ஆல் ஓவர் கோஸ்ட் ஃபுல்லாக எல்லா ஆக்டிவிட்டீஸையும் உள்ளடக்கி என்ன வளங்கள் இருக்குது என்ன இது இருக்குது டெப்த் என்ன எல்லாத்தையும் வந்து சர்வே பண்ணுறது ஒரு வேலையும் வந்து இப்ப அவங்க தொடங்கிட்டாங்க அதுல எர்த் அண்ட் சயின்ஸ் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் தான் வந்து பண்ண போறாங்க so msp the marine spatial plan uh, is the of uh, a form in which uh, uh, the blue economy is uh, mainly attained uh, ncsr has started this as a pilot project in pondicherry this is the map in uh, orissa orissa uh, this is an example of uh, orissa so the core 
space the every uh, data inside the coast uh, no fishing area uh, the fishing uh, the ellame mangroves ellame the economy the mangroves every everything inside the uh, oil uh, gas uh, oil gas offshore energy wind everything inside the uh, 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 ocean as Uh, mm, uh, as being included in this plan ana idla inda valarchi la vandu inda valarchi kaga ipa oru kaattupilli gramam anda thuraimugathukaga thanoda vaalvidangalai vaalvadarthai anadanga avungaloda vaalkai neenga nalla irukkaan pathina adla oru kelvi kuri inni kerikkume avanga indha vidathume kelvi kuriya dhaan irukku adhe pola ivvalavu valarchi endra உண்மையான <laughs> <laughs> இப்போது <laughs> Uh, grabs the resources like water what is water security uh, 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 everything uh, but then until now because of the true protest of the fisher folk and this has been uh, their victory until now uh, and with this i finish my uh, speech thank you um thank you sir vanan sir uh, for the uh, presentation and uh, thank you uh durga uh, shiva and, and uh, mustafa for translate helping the presentation like uh, informative inno nariya questions irukku ellarku adukapra chat box la podunga um and uh, so before we get into the question uh, q and a section we have uh, another person uh, to um, who can who is going to speak a little bit on the vadavan port in maharashtra and the um, similar kinds of people's movement that's happening there um so it's uh, neha rani from uh, um from rasha who is a researcher and uh, uh, is currently involved in uh, creating a documentary film uh, who can well um i will uh, leave let uh, neha continue now oh, hi uh, am i audible uh, yeah yes you are okay uh, so, uh thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, i'm sorry i i am on field and traveling so couldn't prepare any presentation but uh, i'll try and in ha ah, sorry hello hello yeah 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 we can hear you ha huh. yeah yeah thank you uh so uh, i i was asked to uh, speak on madhavan and i'll focus on that uh, one issue more and just give a brief information on the refinery issue as well so uh, madhavan uh, is a coastal area coastal uh, a village which is uh, near to pal closer to dahanu uh dahanu town and uh, this entire area is a uh, ecologically sensitive area and it's been recognized it's been given that status by the uh, government and uh, there was a case in uh, 90s and a similar kind of project was proposed then and at that time uh, 
a movement was formed and that led to formation of a dahanu environmental protection authority so this is a sort of a regulatory body that uh, has a say or a, a ultimate uh, authority over environmental matters pertaining to this specific area because it was recognized as ecologically fragile and sens sensitive so uh, at in 1996 uh, the similar kind of project proposed by an australian company was scrapped entirely and uh, that was considered to be a victory of people's movement who wanted to protect their livelihood at that time and also the of course the environment or uh, back to 20 uh, like next uh, 2014 uh, so uh, after the government changed and uh, there is this talk about blue revolution and change in coastal policy uh in 2015 the uh, local committee which had fought uh, uh, previously in 1990s uh read in a newspaper about the project being revived and uh, they had not been informed there was no administrative talk on ground about such revival of project but they found out on in paper so they uh, went ahead and filed a case and after that it was uh, uh, after that they found out that there was actual an official talk on how this new project uh, earlier it was australian government that was going to be a uh, australian company that was uh, going to partner in this whole venture but now it's it was going to uh, be formed or uh, be revived under the name of jnpt so jnpt is a closer port to uh, this area wadwan area and this area now is being looked as a extension of jnpt and the uh, reason that they are uh, giving is jnpt is not able to handle the load and we need to uh, as we all know compete with china and uh, you know get better revenue in through port and especially the uh, uh, port led trade so that is the reason that is being given but the reality is that like uh, a couple of days ago there was a news item which said that jnpt is not being utilized to its fullest capacity so this whole uh, notion of uh, extending or improving the capacity of jnpt needs to be questioned in like in the first place uh, so after 2015 when this uh, news of port being revived was out in open uh, the court case again began uh, so this court case is majorly uh, the petitioners are nff led unions and a local union that is uh, responsible for this whole uh, movement uh, in legal sense so uh, this uh, legality of the matter is that there is a case in high court as of now and again uh, since i i had mentioned earlier like at the beginning dahanu uh, environment protection authority uh, is the regulatory body that takes uh, uh, that that presides over environmental matters so there is a parallel hearing uh, going on in dahanu environmental port uh, 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 sorry protection authority as well so these two legal battles are being fought since 2017 uh so in like 2020 there was uh more awareness being created by youth and local uh, youth formed smaller groups and they started mobilizing people on ground they started visiting each villages and gave more uh, uh, uh information or specific information regarding major port trust act and how it's going to affect them directly via wadhwan port and why it is how it's going to be detrimental to their livelihoods and this all led to continuous uh, 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 continuous agitations uh, in 2021 and even this year there was a, a fishing uh, fish fisheries uh, ban like all markets across the states were closed all fish markets across the states were closed 
uh, to support the Badwan movement on 2nd October. And there was this huge human chain as well. So uh, the locals are being innovative, finding different ways to protest and register uh, their opposition to this project altogether. Uh, last week, uh, last month on 17 November, there was a huge uh, morcha uh, that was uh, that happened at Mumbai Azad Maidan, and people from across uh, Mumbai, uh, like the coastal city, uh, uh, of course. Uh, came the indigenous uh, Koli people came in support of this cause, and there were uh, people from Palghar and Dahanu district as well. So there was about uh, more than ten thousand people who gathered on ground to uh, make sure that their voices are heard. And uh, on seventeenth November, they were promised a meeting with uh, CM uh, Maharashtra CM to hear their side of the story and how uh, how this issue can be resolved. So that is still on hold. They are still waiting for their meeting with the CM. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the court has also promised an expert committee to have a look at, look at the ground because uh, the locals have challenged the uh, project proposal that, that, uh, that has false information uh, pertaining to livelihoods, ecology, and the uh, anticipated impacts of the project. So they are uh, the uh, basic uh, baseline data is being challenged by the locals. And so the courts has uh, have agreed to form a new export committee and they will be visiting the grounds and along with the locals, of course, uh, to uh, have uh, to verify the data or if a new fresh report needs to be prepared. So uh, that is hap uh, what is happening on legal front. Uh, uh, what I like from my uh, observations and from my field visits, what I have observed is that this is a major fish producing area, especially uh, the coastal or uh, the intertidal zone of Ward 1 or the specific uh, locations where they consider as golden belts for fishing, the local fisher folks, the traditional fisher folks have uh, immense dependencies on these specific areas. So what this project proposes is reclamation of land within like near the coast in the sea. So there won't be any land acquisition, but the sea, there will be reclamation of sea. And it will, again, as we have seen in case of William, impact the adjacent coast uh, through erosion and other ecological impacts as we are seeing in other parts. So people are ad people are sure that they, they won't be uh, tolerating any uh, reclamation especially. Uh, uh, so the uh, proposed uh, area for reclamation as of now is 6,500 acres. And there is, a pro, like within the proposal, there is another anticipation that they might uh, increase this uh, 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 reclamation if there is a need for it. So there is al already that clause that it may go beyond 6,500 acres. Another interesting fact is this is a PESA area, uh, Dahanu Taluka or Dahanu block. So uh, there is a... Uh, there is a solidarity between tribal folks and fisher folks in opposing uh, this particular project, which uh, we uh, saw on ground during Murcha also, because the tribal folks are dependent in terms of their diet and also for livelihood. Some of the traditional fisher folks employ these uh, tribals as uh, 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 they, they go as a fisherman on boats. So uh, they are doubly dependent on uh, this livelihood. So that is one aspect uh, that is no uh, that is not being highlighted enough. Uh, also, if there is a reclamation on sea, the uh, the whatever the uh, natural resources that these areas or these tribals have, especially the hills, will be mined for that reclamation and. Tribals are already aware of that and they are not willing to give up on their existing natural resources. So they are joining hands.
hand in support of this movement like uh, since since they they were actively involved in 90s also and they are actively involved uh, at this point of time also so uh, yeah this is i think if uh, i'll take questions if there are any and just like if you could give me 2 minutes i would just give a brief uh uh Uh, highlight on what is the refinery issue in kokan if i have 2 minutes yeah 2 minutes be good yeah thanks uh so uh, so this entire uh, belt coastal belt uh, right from palghar till uh, sindhudurg is uh, in maharashtra's administrative uh, dis, uh, definition it's a kokan coast kokan region itself so it has six district and palgar is one of them those and another district is ratnagiri district where they have proposed the refinery so why there is this opposition to refinery because a it is supposed to be the biggest refinery in the world so imagine the amount of pollution it will cause b uh, this a uh, whole project is entirely for the good of the uh saudi arabia or aramco to be uh, to name a uh, to name a particular entity so uh, crude oil will be imported it will be processed on in this area kokan uh, like the refinery area and then 97% of the pr processed produces will be exported back to the country of its origin so whatever we will be or the this specific region will be left with is uh, air pollution soil pollution and also water pollution uh, since it's a coastal area where they will be transporting the oil storing the crude oil so there are high chances of oil spillage uh, which will again affect the livelihood of these fisher folks uh, second thing is this area is known for its alfonso mango it has the this mango has a gi tag and uh, it has high value in terms of export so any change in environment because it's a very fragile cash crop so any change in the environment will damage the productivity or even its existence or to begin with and it's already facing threats in times of climate change and uh, also the uh, like geographically where this uh, refinery is placed is uh, is where these villages are dependent on for its water so it will impact its uh, dependency ecological dependency of these uh, these uh, areas these loc locals and even though the uh, the project doesn't talk about any displacement but eventually there will be dis displacement which will be posed so these people may not even get compensation and it will be considered as voluntary whereas it will be driven due to the pollution uh people of this region have opposed uh, such polluting pro uh, projects in the past also they opposed the jaitapur nuclear project the starlight project that was previously uh, proposed in this area so uh, these people are not as it is the narrative is being said that these people are against development these people what these people are demanding is they don't want any red category project that will lead to polluting their environment uh, so that, that is their main demand no they are saying we are not against development but we want development on our terms and we don't want to accept defin de definition of development by a company or as imposed by the government uh, so as of now people are resisting on ground uh, uh, this week only they uh, one of the villages uh, elected a refinery uh, op uh, opposing panel in the gram sabha so they are fighting at the level of gram sabha and uh, trying to or uh, meet or get, gain support from politicians but that hasn't worked out well because it's a huge project and no political party is willing to take stand openly in support of the people and to speak anything against the project so uh, the current or uh, such uh, stance by all political parties be it uh, the governing party or the 
opposing op party in opposition are they are in the role of wait and watch and they they are hoping that the uh, opposition or the resistance will die down and so that they can move ahead with the project but uh, the resistance has been going on for over a year now and uh, people are uh, more and more determined with every passing day and the kind of oppression they are facing from the state um, is adding to that determination so yeah thank you thank you for giving additional time uh, thank you so much neha mm -hmm. um, especially what you said about uh, uh, development the idea of development being reclaimed by the people that is something that we sh uh, we should think about and that's something that sort of goes across all uh, all the instances that we looked at in the coast uh, the whether the east in kerala or maharashtra or um, in tamil nadu or anywhere else uh, moving to the idea of like and recognizing that the agenda about development and growth is reclaiming that it's is what maybe what we are all part of um so now we can move on move on to the question answers um if people have any questions uh, we can start with that um i had one question for um so uh, soumya about the uh blue carbon uh or about that uh, to say is it something like the the carbon trading that is happening these days uh, is is it connected to that or is it, how is that coming about uh see this carbon trading comes as the next stage first you have to have the carbon sequestration now based on which the calculations are being done carbon sequestration means you are taking off carbon dioxide it's not carbon it's carbon dioxide but it's called carbon sequestration so you are taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere there is plants too so one is you can do sequestration by either forests or by soil carbon which uh, some agriculture does better or the recent push because as i said there is always a far here sir contest on land because land has multiple use multiple stakeholders and being quite uh, densely populated whereas the oceans and the coastal belts are seen as not so fiercely contested so the new push is blue carbon because blue carbon means is carbon cannot become blue but in the blue waters the marine plants or the uh, in the marine environment whatever plant growth takes place and you know particularly in the coastal waters these are rich in nutrients where the upwelling takes place the lot of sunlight filters through the base the bottom of the uh, sea base the uh, coastal areas the floor of the ocean so there can be lot of growth and there actually is lot of growth so this is the new target and once you can actually uh, show that lot of new growth has taken place that can be calculated this is the business calculation as i said the climate uh, crisis is being seen as a business opportunity new business opportunity opportunity once you can show that this much extra growth has taken place that can be calculated how much carbon dioxide it has sequestered over a year how many tons or thousands of tons or millions of tons that will require a huge area and then this then can be used by industries by power plants by countries rich countries which are not actually reducing their emissions they will say we are giving little money to this project there in india or bangladesh or thailand or myanmar Or, or anywhere else, so that this new carbon growth is happening, new sequestration is happening. So this, supposing ten thousand tons, they estimated this ten thousand tons will be credited to the company or the entity or the government in a rich country, which will not be actually reducing, but they will be in effect notionally they are not, but they are in effect reducing. So they will not be required to reduce by that much in exchange of a little money. So this actually do not reduce. This do not uh, help. the climate uh, take tackling the climate change but market mechanism will be effectively showing they are doing this so this is the carbon trading mechanism carbon trading is part of the larger carbon market governance structure but one thing i need uh, can if we 
there is one important aspect I needed to point out because the first two presentations I was listening to, I have been involved with the NFF for the last 11, 12 years, the National Fish Workers Forum and both the other platform also. In fact, uh, we have been hearing these stories for the last 20 years, not begin jump, but similar stories across the coast, across the country. I think it's high time that we go uh, beyond this just narrating the stories again and again. This is important. Uh, but what you have must have seen that this again and again narrating the people beyond those pe uh, those areas. Like I know of the Vingham struggle. I have been there in uh, uh, LFP recently in November. I was taking the national workshop for a NFF, the National uh, Fish Workers Forum for building climate resilience. And this workshop, particularly, there are two resource persons, myself and AJ Bijan. Those in Kerala might know AJ Bijan. So we were uh, doing both on impacts of climate change and impacts of developmental projects. First thing, you need to do proper scientific grounded studies to challenge this in multiple fora. First, that's one. Second thing, even though the level resistance at the ground level, whether it is Tamil Nadu or Kerala or West Bengal, where Odisha, where a lot of projects are coming up, we need to go beyond just resistance or opposition at that, that spot. And that is why many of us have been interacting with NFF and other coastal stakeholders that you focus on developing a coastal rights bill leading to a coastal rights act in line with the forest rights act. And this is a long-standing discussion. We have pressurized and a lot of discussed them, pressurized them. Unfortunately, the leadership of these organizations, like NFF, the Kerala group is KSMTF, and Jackson and others are leaders. Now, they probably don't have that capacity, but the national leaderships of this union, because uh, KSMTF, the Kerala Fish Workers Union, is part of the NFF. Now, there are uh, 10 or 12 such unions which built up the national unions. They must now take a lead and take these struggles out of just the local resistance into a national and international forum. Like if you recall, the few months ago, the WTO negotiations, it was an opportunity to push for rights of small scale fish workers, which was completely lost. The Indian government took some representatives from NFF. They could not understand what is going on. And they actually lost an opportunity to push for rights against big uh, exploitative fishers, which are big uh, fishing trawlers, huge fishing trawlers and push for rights of the small ones. So I think our preparations must go much beyond this. And our preparations need to understand that these things are not just because of one industrialist or one government. This is coming from a global agenda and we need to really attack that. And the actions that we take need to be proactive. We are now once the project has come, we are reacting. Everywhere we are reacting, and that's a defeat strategy. You cannot keep on reacting, and that's too late, because the projects start five to six years before, in paper, in preparation, in financial closer, before the time you see them on the ground. I think these kind of preparations are highly needed. We can't just limit ourselves to just narrating the stories again and again, which is important, but that doesn't lead anywhere much. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, that that makes a lot of sense. And speaking of which, um, Collective is going to have a couple of programs around uh, like blue economy uh, in the coming days. Um, it, it's not nothing is set in stone, but like we we'll announce later. Uh, so if people who are interested, we'll send put out a um, like a form um, to get in touch with us, and also the link to our website so we can get in touch with us. Um, so. Uh, we can move on to other questions. We might have to extend li little beyond time if there are more questions. Um, yeah, other questions from people? Okay, I think uh, we can wrap up in that case. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the. Thank you so much uh, for panelists, um, like Samya and uh, Sindhu and uh, Sharanan and also Neha, uh, who gave us a lot of information and a lot of insight about uh, the coastal crisis that is happening. Um, before we leave, I uh, just want to do, like like I said, there are a, there is there are some programs that we are starting. Uh, we are uh, coming. 
bringing together um, on Blue Economy later uh, in the coming weeks. So if anyone is interested, we, you can use that link and uh, get in touch with us later. Uh, there is also the website to collective you can uh, look at. Um, so yeah, if there's nothing more, we can um, wrap up. All right, yeah. Thank you so much.